system in which effectiveness is secondary oh, to placement. Oh, oh, oh. Y'all got that? You can put somebody, have someone in a position, if you are a performance-oriented church, that's what you do. And then you start getting into other things, you know, uh, uh, nepotism and, yeah. and uh, um, servitude. And, and, you know, but the ultimate goal is, uh, is it productive? Yeah. You know, is this person really producing? Because mm -hmm. you know what leadership really is, right? It's productivity. Mm -hmm. You need to, it's real simple. <laughs> it's productivity. So if you, if you, if, if, if you are a person and you have a circle that has been this way for a long time and there is no uh, impact, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I knew I was called a pastor. I knew I was called a ministry because people wanted to hear me. They wanted to hear you. Yeah, see, yeah <laughs> seriously. That don't have anything to do with personalities or programs. It's because when they knew I was going to be ministering at the church, they showed up. Huh? When people when people get around you and you're talking about God, they don't want to be bothered, then you don't have a ministry. <laughs> Come on now, let's be real. If the people close to you don't think nothing about what you have to say, then you don't probably got anything to say to the rest of us. <laughs> That's true. Um, you said before, ministry is for, for the people. It is. It comes from the pride of the people. Yeah. You, the people are your ministry. Yeah. Those are the watching. Yeah. Not groups. Yeah. Not buildings. You know what I'm saying? Not resumes of connections, of uh, uh, alliances, and looking to network all through, and you know, like a little snake. <laughs> people, people are your ministry. Mm -hmm. Amen. So you can, huh, go ahead. people say sometimes, but I don't care. You care about but what? You should care. Care about what? People, they don't care about what people think. <laughs> Man, I wrote something a long time ago. I don't have it on me, but you emasculate your purpose. You better care. <laughs> You better care because when I look at this Bible, Jesus is all about fruits and, and Paul is always talking about, in fact, Paul said, I'm, I'm not even going to put you as a deacon or a bishop until I go outside and find out your reputation. Uh-oh. That's what he said in the, in the pastoral letters in 1 Timothy 3. He said, you know what? I need to go to your job and find out how, how you are on your job. And I told you, the next group of leaders, that's what's going to happen. I'm going to find out how you are at home. I want to know your friends. I'm telling you, it's, it's people that hold this, I mean, hold it high esteem. I, I know one pastor, his name, I'm going to say his name, his name is Dr. Jonathan David. He's over in Malaysia. And he had it so that when he just, he don't even call his, his sons in the ministry or his, his um, leadership core. He just show up. It could be 8 o'clock, 7 a.m., 8 o'clock. He just comes through because he don't have enough time to respond. You can go put up your, your DVDs and all that stuff. Of course, you know, you don't see the, you know, you don't see the frailty of human flesh. Of course, you know, they're all like this and stuff. All this. But I understood the concept because it's really intimate. You know, when you start establishing borders and boundaries, then you, in certain places, you can't go. I don't know where I want to go. This is what we talk, this is why I talk on leadership when we get together in the leadership. There's certain things you got to do in order to make sure that you are a, a candidate yeah. for that particular position. But that's true relationship. And, it is. And that's the thing. I, I think that sometimes people look at that as a, you know, what uh, he's putting pressure on me. But if you're really living the life and you're really in relationship with somebody, the Bible says to know them that labor among you. Well, how do you get to know them? If you just see their church face. Yeah, yeah. He ain't going to get in there. He don't know that church, that church face. <laughs> They got that, that, that get uh, fossilized. <laughs> that, that church, that church, <laughs> let me quit. <laughs> Number four, let me get out of there. Uh, politics, which is popularity driven, when one is concerned with recognition or reward. I'm going to do a teaching on all four of these and really break it down so we can get an understanding because these things have to be removed for us to not only understand fivefold grace, but for us to get to the point where the kingdom of God is manifested. Yeah. You know, yeah. these things touch every every denomination, mm -hmm. none or denominated. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No matter. <laughs> and these things have polluted the gospel. It has limited the gospel and kept the gospel in a religious context. And Jesus didn't have such doctrine. So we've taught things that was contrary to God, and Jesus didn't even have them. Amen to your neighbor. Jesus didn't have them. Jesus didn't have them. Why should you? Why should you? 
See, when our, our motives and our methods are one in him, and we can move past the charisma of ca ca capturing an audience to the character which keeps one, I'm going to say that again. When our motives and methods are one in him, and when we move past the charisma of capturing an audience to the character which keeps one, along with other initiatives we're going to share, we will begin to see a transparent church, for we have nothing to hide. Thank you, Pastor. That was Pat Myers over there watching. She is excited. Because another thing I wrote was, our greatest challenge is to move away from what we used to be to everything he has assigned us to become. Amen. That's your greatest challenge. Amen. Let's be honest, you guys. Some of you guys are struggling for, because of where you've been. I don't care if it's the thinking, the living arrangement, the friends, the job, all that stuff is because of where you've been. Our history is our greatest hindrance. Let me write that down. Write that down, Pat. Our history is our greatest hindrance. Now, we're going to finally tap into fivefold ministry, what it's all about, the grace of it. Uh, let's go to Ephesians 4, 11. I'm going to have uh, Vanessa read it and amplify it. So it's going to be a little slightly different, but I like to amplify it. The Message Bible and Amplified, I love them back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Oh, is that 10? Yeah, that's 10, my fault. Start at 10. Start at 10. Yeah. He who descended is the very same as he who also has ascended high above all the heavens, that he, his presence, might feel all things. The whole universe, from the lowest to the highest, 11, and his gifts were some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. His intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, that they should that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the knowledge of the Son of God that we, at, that we, I'm used to some red, <laughs> <laughs> that we, at, that we, wait, let me read it over, knowledge of the Son of God at the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and the completeness found in him. Mm -hmm. While ascending on high, Jesus regulated gifts unto certain men. So the thing is here that the knowledge of the Son of God, that we might arrive at really mature manhood. He wants to, he, so God, Jesus himself descended and ascended. Mm -hmm. But when he descended, he felt everything. Mm -hmm. Things seen and things unseen. Mm -hmm. the, the heavens, the earth, and the heavens. Mm -hmm. And when he did that, what he did, he recovered whatever was lost. Which I believe when he said he gave gifts unto, he took him to captivity and gave gifts unto men. I believe the captivity was, uh, I thought of a lot of different things. I think it has a lot to do with the purpose he gave in Genesis 1. I didn't. Yeah, I did. I really, I really think that that's the thing that really hurts the church is we don't understand our manhood, yeah. our sonship. You get what I'm saying? We understood, we understand church church, Christianity, but we don't understand sonship and manhood. Manhood is, yeah. it don't have anything to do with gender. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, so it's not a gender thing. Because yeah, you all call it man. Yeah. And that man is the perfect man. That perfect man is Christ. It's, it's Christ in us the whole glory. You, you guys got that? Mm -hmm. And so, not only were the fivefold the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, they were given an assignment and an assignment was given to men. Now read that part. It says, while ascending on high. While ascending on high, Jesus regulated gifts unto certain men, enabling and equipping them to function as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in order to carry out, to carry on his five-faceted ministry in his stead. So he gave the fivefold ministry. Some call it the ascension ministries. So a lot of different places, it's the same thing. Ascension ministry, fivefold ministry. And they were given on his stead. Mm -hmm. So there's a DNA that's in those five yes. that has been divided by Christ. Mm -hmm. It's actually a divine deposit from Christ himself to those. I know it's, it's a muck right now. It's a, <laughs> you know, the body has been polluted and there's been a lot of transgression of <laughs> Ephesians 4. But God, I believe... I, in, 
I just know that the Indian guy's going to be speaking. And I know that the vision, though, at Terry, it won't lie. That, that I believe. So I don't care what's happening right now across the globe. It's going to change. Can I mention something? Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about five different gifts or essential gifts. We're we talking about five different gifts with five different graces. So which means each one of these gifts individually have a grace to function and do certain things to help mature the body. Bring it into unity. Absolutely. Intimacy. Absolutely. 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 And I, I mean, you, you can't have an evangelist come and start. Let me say this. You can have an evangelist to start a church. But the evangelist is used to gather the people. When he gather the people, then normally, according to the Bible, when you had any one of the disciples or any one of the uh, apostles, prophets, go in a region, you'll find out in Titus and other places that Philemon, they said that you go into that city, that region, and get elders and establish elders over those regions. Mm -hmm. So they was just the beachhead. They was, they was just what God used to go in and break open that region. You get what I'm saying? But if you want to get a church and build on and you want the church to have maximized potential, then you need all cylinders. You need an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. You can't just depend on evangelists to be pastoral. Mm -hmm. And you just can't depend on an apostle to be pastoral. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that means you got to have, we got to identify, we've done a, so many teachings on apostles and prophets before. One of the gifts, evangelists and teacher, we haven't spent a lot of time on, in which I'm going to put that demand on me to come up with some uh, things out of scriptures and, and allow the Holy Spirit to prick my brain a bit to show you in scriptures how important it is to have the evangelist and teacher in, in full, um, on full mold, mm -hmm. on blast, Amen. so they can find out what God wants to do with that whole well, Sometimes, too, the people, and I think what they do is they call themselves a pastor instead of calling themselves an evangelist or a teacher. Because they want to pastor a church, and 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 they are pastors. See, that's the thing. Uh, you can you can uh, be an evangelist and pastor. That's not what I'm saying. So you can be an evangelist and start a church. In fact, you got the strongest churches when it, in, in the first uh, tr the first trimester. They call it one to three years. Is having a, a a pastor or a senior leader that is more inclined to evangelism. Because you're going to need new growth. Yeah. You're going to need people to come in. You know what I'm saying? If you have an apostle coming to start a church, it's, gonna, it's not, you know, he's going to deal with what's on hand. 